Okay, uh, Dr. McLeod, are you ready to get started? I, I am. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you. Uh, okay. I think most of our folks are on you, so if you have okay. help, if you have challenges hearing, just um, send Megan um, uh, a message via the chat box. Mm -hmm. So good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, depending where you are uh, in Canada. We have a truly cross-country uh, presentation today for the October session of our KT Canada seminar series. Uh, my name is Kate Sibley. I'm moderating today from Winnipeg, Manitoba, and we're delighted to have our speaker with us today, Dr. Martha McLeod from the University of Northern British Columbia. Um, so before we begin, I'll briefly explain uh, our procedure for today. Dr. McLeod will be giving us an approximately 45-minute presentation, after which we will have uh, some time for questions. Uh, because everyone is muted, if you have uh, questions from your site or as an individual, you can let us know by contacting the KT moderator uh, via the chat box, or you can pre present um, a question to everyone in the chat. Um, and so then Megan will relay the uh, questions to our to our speaker. So uh, as I said, we're very pleased to have Dr. Martha McLeod with us today, who's going to be speaking to us about honoring practice, dialogue, and difference, uh, and taking a hermeneutic approach to knowledge translation. Dr. McLeod is a professor at the University of Northern British Columbia, where she is the Northern Health UNDP Knowledge Mobilization Research Chair, and she co-leads UNBC's Health Research Institute. Martha takes a qualitative, partnered approach to exploring how knowledge is created and taken up in health services, particularly in sparsely populated areas. She has led two nursing practice in rural and remote Canada studies, and is examining how primary healthcare transformation occurs in a rural and northern health authority. Martha regularly engages with researchers, practitioners, health service leaders, and policymakers in advancing regional, national, and international research and KT networks. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Martha, and very much looking forward to your talk. Why, thank you. I'm um, very pleased to be here and just wanted to do a, a sound check as well. Um, the uh, the um, I want to acknowledge uh, that today I am on the, um, the traditional lands of the Claytley Tene, and um, just for those of you who've seen that there was a gas line explosion um, on the Claytley Tene lines, uh, they're in the process of uh, fixing it, and um, all is well there. Um, today I'm going to be talking largely, um, you're going to find that this talk is, is more philosophical and theoretical than many of the ones that, um, that you, we have on the KT seminar series. Um, and I'm, I'm doing that on purpose because the question of how to do a hermeneutic approach really comes into a stance, a way of thinking about it and a way of approaching. And so that's why I move back into the philosophical approach and hopefully that I'll be able to link it with enough examples. And please do not hesitate um, to keep your, your questions and see if we can get to more practical if, if I'm not keeping it practical enough. The um, objectives of today's talk are what is hermeneutics and a hermeneutic approach? What does it mean to take a, um, a hermeneutic approach to KT. What would be needed um, in practical terms, I think, to uh, mobilize and translate knowledge? I'm using mobilization as a, um, in a very particular way because of the, the notion of translation um, is, is very positive in that it is about the exchange. But the mobilizing, I'm finding, uh, works a little better as I'm looking at different ways of, of approaching um, KT. So what you see here is the tenth hole of a small golf course here in BC. And why golf? One of the things that all of us have had great frustrations with over the years is having knowledge and then not being able to put it into practice, or having knowledge and working with people and it gets picked up and 
then not sustained. Well, golf is like that, um, and particularly for me. When I went to university, I had to take uh, required phys ed, and one of the requirements of one of the options is to take golf. So I took golf um, as in, in lessons, and I liked it, and I so I practiced golf. Now that was in the basement of a uh, phys ed building at University of Toronto, and I got very, very good at a golf stance, at having a good golf swing, except the only place I could play golf was uh, banging balls against a canvas mat in the basement. So when it came out, when it came to actually putting it into practice and reading the golf course, and then figuring out how different lays um, happened, when with all of that complexity, I found that my golf was not very good. And this many years later, it's still not very good. It's something I enjoy. But it's putting that knowledge into practice um, in place and over time that we find to be very, very difficult. So what is hermeneutics? Hermeneutics is interpretation. The goal is to make sense generally of a text. Now, what a text has been over the years is including um, reading uh, it started with the with the Bible and then um, with hermeneutics and then it's it's any kind of a text or action and to understand so the goal is understanding and hermeneutics is more than just a series of principles or methods and it's an art so it's the it's the being able to understand and make oneself understood. Hermeneutics and a hermeneutic approach cannot be reduced to analytical principles. And that's a very important um, notion because so much of our work with knowledge translation is doing an analysis of the situation, coming into principles, and then implementing um, those principles. Understanding in hermeneutics is grasping knowledge and facts and then integrating it into a meaningful whole. So for instance, I come home, and I may not, I may be late one day, and I, my husband takes a look at me, and the cat turns away, and I'm thinking, okay, I have got a smile from my husband, a turn away from the cat, and I then pick up all of those uh, clues, and I realize that what I hadn't done is picked up the um, food that was supposed to be there. So I was, uh, there were some expectations it was knowing those facts, but putting it into a meaningful whole that meant that understanding was I grasped things and then understood it in a different way. So hermeneutics has a lot to do with how we understand being, meaning, and knowing. So on the left, what I've got here is a, a, the usual scientific paradigm of the subject-object delineation and how you think and feel is, is delineated. Uh, people are in a world, but there is an objectivity and a subjectivity. So in order to understand what's in people's heads, you then uh, take an objective approach to get at the subjectivity, or we get a, um, an subject, uh, we, we get a, a process by which we look at things objectively. The left-hand side here is the absolute normal, what has become normal way of scientific process and that has become a, the normal way of expecting good quality uh, research, good quality implementation is that you can be objective um, in the world, you can um, in, in, in some ways bracket what it is that you know about it. You can create um, tools that are uh, reliable and, and more important and valid, but more importantly that reliable. So it doesn't matter who implements the tool, you will get the same information every single time because your concepts are so clear and you then are able to uh, implement that way of thinking in the world is is the normal, and I'm oversimplifying this. You know, don't get me wrong, I'm really oversimplifying it. On the right, you have the move in philosophical thought to uh, what is more in the social constructionism area. And that is, is that we are in the world, there is some uh, people really uh, do say that there is the subjective and objective are interconnected, and that 
meaning is created socially, that there is social construction and it, it comes through uh, conversation or for instance in grounded theory, it comes from um, a form of symbolic interaction is where there's interaction of symbols and we come up with co-creation. This is the, on the right hand side is where co-creation um, stands and a, a lot of, that's the social constructionism which is becoming much a greater perspective and in the knowledge to action area. So I'll come back to that uh, in a while. I'm coming into where hermeneutics has come from. Um, and I just go back a little bit. So we, it, it's been very helpful to me to know where things come from and then figure out, try to delineate what kind of approach is, is different. And when people say, oh, I do the same thing as you do, um, and I know I feel it doesn't feel quite right, I'm able to figure out what line and tradition people come from that might be quite uh, a little different or um, similar. So I go back to, to her, uh, Schleiermacher back in the um, late 1700s, early 1800s, and he looked at um, interpreting the Bible. And at that time, that was a very big thing to do. And he identified the concept and brought into the, into the philosophical discussion that notion of understanding. And, and what we are about is understanding and not just looking at um, a um, trusting what is being written on the page, but finding a way to understand it. Next person that comes along is Dilphy. And Dilphy is absolutely a critical figure in hermeneutics. And he talked about understanding and interpretation constitute the method of the social sciences. So he delineated between the social sciences and the natural sciences, the life sciences, indicating that it wasn't just a matter of the scientific method, but that understanding and interpretation needed to come into when, uh, seen when we work with people and groups. He coined the term, the lived experience. Now you, can, you know, those of you who do phenomenology know that lived experience came, um, uh, de developed. And he talked about analysis of the life world. Now, those notions, what, what we see is, is different branches coming off. And the social constructionists come back to Dilphi's notion. So there is some commonality and notions here. Um, and the phenomenologist picked up on lived experience. So those were there. And you can see then that, that in, um, I come back to the um, being as a separate objective in the world. The, after Dilphi, that separation of objective and subjective continued in much of the social sciences, but recognizing that you needed to look into the subjective meaning more. And then it also spawned the, um, on the right hand side, that social interaction. So much of um, Dilphi's work comes back, uh, it was, is being carried on uh, in the social constructionism um, area. Then after um, Dilphi, Husserl, came along um, and he talks about the life world. He picked up on Dilthey's notion of the life, life world. And he um, brought in and, and talked a lot about meaning and he coined the notion of phenomenology. And the piece here was that you could go to the things themselves. You did not need a theoretical framework. You did not need the, um, the the framework of a theory in order to understand what was, in order to pick up what was going on, you could go to the things themselves. And that's where the notion of bracketing came in. And Husserl talks about bracketing in that you keep yourself in abeyance, you keep your understanding in abeyance so you can see the things themselves. Now, I've got Schutz here because Schutz is a social phenomenologist who it's being picked up by many individuals um, and in North America um, a lot. Social phenomenology, Schutz's work was picked up 
um, and taken on by the institutional ethnographers, taken on by a whole number of people. Um, where Schutz uh, in the States, he uh, picked up on the pragmatists too, and he connected the subject to the social world and uh, in, in a particular way. And that comes from Husserl. Now, a student of Husserl's was Heidegger. Uh, and Heidegger lived uh, and did some work, and his main uh, work is being in time. And what Heidegger did was he undercut the subject-object delineation. He talked about how understanding is grounded in being in the world. One is already in the world. One is already thrown into, into life. And being in the world puts you in a situation of, of understanding meaning that is already there in everybody's background practices and language. Now, what does that mean? What it means is that we have some background meaning of um, what going, all of us may have been at a Thanksgiving, or many of us may have been at a Thanksgiving dinner uh, over this weekend. And there is some background understanding about what Thanksgiving dinners mean. Now, it, they may be different for different families. Um, they may be different within different cultures in Canada. But there is some meaning that is already there that when we walk into a room uh, with dinner, with Thanksgiving dinner, we expect certain things. We know certain things will be there. There is a shared meaning of what Thanksgiving may mean within our families or, or groups of people. We know that if our meaning is that Thanksgiving is for family and you're not there, you're, you're alone that day, there's a, there's a sense of being alone that comes from that background meaning. And language is the sharing of language. Well, one of the things that Heidegger talked about was that um, language is the house of being. And I remember when my son was 12 and he was learning how to play football. And I realized that he, he was a you know, normal 12 year old. He put on his football uniform and all of a sudden, you'd hear his language change, his demeanor would change, and you realize that he became a football player. And so the meaning of being a football player, you could just see being taken on in what he was wearing and then what he, how he talked and what he talked about. Um, phenomenology, Heidegger talked about phenomenology as, as a way towards seeing that understanding. But he brought in interpretation, knowing that in order to um, get at what is there in the world, what we have to uncover what is not immediately apparent. You cannot assume that what you see is what is there. Interpretation is, is what you do. And he identified that we are interpreting beings. I don't think it was him, but it's somebody speaking about uh, what he has. We are interpreting beings all the way down. And what that means is every time we talk, every time we look, every time we um, understand something, we are interpreting it. It's just not coming to us um, as uh, unfiltered. We have filters and interpret as, as we go. Now remember, these are philosophical stances and there are people that do not believe that. But this is what Heidegger set up. The other um, identification is that he, he uh, looked at how time, we work with time, how we are temporal beings, in that um, time is in the activity. When you are engaged, for instance, um, in uh, playing, and, and, and you see that when, and I, I see that when I'm um, in uh, working on, on um, uh, something that I'm writing, uh, time flies out the window and I, the, my temporality, um, it, it, it stops or it starts or time flows is the, is the feeling. And what Heidegger talked about is how we are already um, moving in time. He identified, now he wasn't the first one to talk about the hermeneutic circle, but he brought in the notion of the hermeneutic circle as being a very important thing. 
and that is that we understand something only in relation to the whole of which, which it is a part and vice versa. For instance, I walk into um, a meeting and there is, uh, I, I look at a, um, um, people are standing around and I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I see some people there and I think, okay, so what is this meeting about? When I look further and I see who else is there and they might be drinking um, wine rather than coffee, I understand what the wine means perhaps a little more. Then I look at the whole and I understand what the whole means. So I, we do that all the time, is that we understand a part and then part of the whole and then we understand the whole differently because we understand the part. I'll talk more about that a little bit later. So where Heidegger talked about is the way in which we are in the world, that meaning and knowledge is that we have a shared set of meanings um, and background knowledge. Now, how does that work in a multicultural area? It's not perfect. There is not, um, the meanings are, um, are, are not fully shared. But there is something that Heidegger talks about is that to be human, uh, is to have language. To be human is to have um, certain uh, certain things, such as uh, you know, in the inseparability of of the, uh, the the subject and the object of the person and the body. Those kinds of things. And you know that um, so that notion of meaning and the situation of meaning and the situation of language is a little different there, or is quite different there. Okay, so who, who else in hermeneutics, and why do why are we continuing? We're continuing because what the kind of hermeneutics that I'm talking about in terms of putting practically into into action comes from Gadamer largely. Gadamer talked about the historic nature of understanding, and that is is that you understand from the past, currently in the present, and always pointed towards the future. Um, language brings about the um, language brings about the um, understanding, just let me get back here, um, and that there is a fusion of horizons. Now I'll talk a little more about fusion of horizons later, but essentially what it means is that we come to uh, any situation, anything that we are interpreting with some prejudgments, with a horizon on our own, the text or what it is that we're encountering, which is not in us, it is out there, has a horizon of it. And what you're trying to do is through dialogue, fuse those horizons. I'll talk more later. Um, Ricoeur is a French um, pheno uh, phenomenologist, a French philosopher. And he talked about um, bringing phenomenology and a phenomenological description, which is very much like a Husserl. Husserl talked about phenomenological description. Heidegger talked about phenomenological interpretation or uh, hermeneutics. Now, Ricoeur joins it with hermeneutics, but he takes the stance of hermeneutics that comes a little older than that, which is a link between the self and the other through dialectical engagement. And so you'll see um, in in um, the Nordic countries, um, there is a development of uh, phenomenological hermeneutics, um, including a starting to look at um, implementation. And they're using a recur approach, but it does keep that separation of the self and the other. And you see the description and the, the flavor of it being really quite different. He talks about metaphor. Um, he did a very interesting work on, on language and narrative theory. He also um, identified how one can turn action into text. So you can take a look at action and then inscribe it um, and do it. And where I have used it is in field notes, where I've shadowed somebody and I describe the action and then it becomes text for interpretation. The last one I want to talk about is Habermas um, in, in this line. Now Habermas brought into um, critical hermeneutics and he is a key figure in critical theory and pragmatism. And he 
so much people bringing on to his work talk about um, the, and recur talked about the um, hermeneutics of suspicion um, and Habermas uh, is a key person in critical hermeneutics and that is where you look to understanding but you also look to what's outside and what is shaping that understanding so when you do hermeneutics from a Gadamerian perspective or a Heideggerian perspective, you look very closely at what is going on and then get a sense of what might be shaping that. Habermas and Ricoeur look very specifically at what shapes what's going on. Okay, so getting away from that philosophy uh, directly and talking about a hermeneutic approach to knowledge translation. Much of knowledge translation is like the bridge itself. This is a train bridge um, in Prince George, longest train bridge in, in uh, BC, we think. And um, it, we look very much at KT being and people doing knowledge brokering and such being on that bridge and being that bridge. One of the things I want us to focus on in today's presentation is the water flowing because the water flows uh, in under the bridge, but it also um, is the, the most meaningful part. It's why the bridge might be there. And it is, it, the water reaches both banks and is something additionally constituted. So what's knowledge mobilization? You look at two um, definitions here. One is CIHRs which is the dynamic and iterative process and it includes these things and most of us if not all of us would know this particular one and it is application of knowledge and I think I think that notion of application of knowledge is something I want us to to consider is that is building knowledge always and translating knowledge always an application of knowledge the research impact is uh, comes out of shirk and it looks about knowledge sharing knowledge so it's an entity of knowledge that is it meaning a separate knowledge is easily accessible useful and used so we've got that um, the notion of knowledge products that make adoption and application more likely so it is a notion again that there's a separate entity that is knowledge that is adopted or applied now the way in which they talk about it is to focus on the potential user of knowledge. So it's not, knowledge is something separate to be used and is part of information. And then if to, to do an analysis of context, interest, needs, and trusted sources, and then there can be um, application of that knowledge. So you see in both of these, there's an assumption um, of that separate knowledge and its use. It's a very instrumental um, approach to knowledge and knowledge translation. And it's largely um, in that separate uh, subjective objective paradigm is that way of thinking on this one. Now knowledge and mobilization and translation is developed over time. And there, that development has been described differently by different people. This one happens to be Alan Best and Bev Holmes. And they, and I find it helpful because they identify linear models uh, with the various concepts of diffusion and dissemination and uptake, and then the knowledge product and such that and processes with communication as being key. The then there's the relationship models with knowledge in exchange and linkage exchange and collaboration. That's where you have that co-production. Then they talk about systems models of knowledge integration, organizational change, and, and recognize the dynamic context and networking, et cetera. I'm arguing that it goes beyond system models. System models says we need to look at how things work, but by the way, he, we, we do it much about what is happening, and we can describe a whole bunch of what's happening, but talk about that how things work through the system is very difficult. So that's what I'm talking about here in a hermeneutic approach is understanding the particulars of the how. Um, now, don't get me wrong, each one of these is really important to have in different ways. 
Um, and what I'm uh, suggesting is that there is another way that can start to get at those prop those really troublesome things is where we we try to um, have knowledge and have it taken up in practice, but it doesn't stick or it doesn't continue. Okay. Now just a second. All right. One of the most common um, things is this knowledge to action framework. And it is really excellent. Uh, it's the, the Graham um, and Tetro model. Um, and it's an excellent piece of it is that it is based on social constructivism with planned change. And it's um, so it's clearly identified. Knowledge stays separately, however, and it is uh, pulled into different places with this. I find it to be a very useful model when I'm talking to people who are focusing on one or another particular places. But it is based then in that social construction um, notion of knowledge. There are a couple of others that I've just put here because as I said earlier, it's very difficult to tell um, are these the same as what I'm talking about? And they're not. These are very specifically talked about social constructivism, which has to do with negotiating meaning and uh, bringing together the co-creation through language. Um, and that's one of the things the social phenomenological study uh, by Carol McWilliam and all take off from the Schutz perspective um, and the social interaction. And this one about deliberative dialogue is um, bringing, building on the knowledge to action model, or a bit of that model, knowledge to action, and then more in um, this inter interconnection. Being, meaning, and knowing in those stays in this paradigm that I've talked about before, in which there is a, um, a, a that very conscious um, co-creation. And that is two separate beings through interaction, creating meaning together in that um, middle middle part. I want to move to philosophical hermeneutics now, which is what I'm talking about. And it's built on Gadamer's work. And even a famous philosopher needs a name tag, is the one I really like about this particular picture. So the hermeneutic approach based on philosophical hermeneutics, which is Gadamerian work, is concerned with interpretation. The goal is understanding. It focuses on meaning and language. It articulates, that word articulate to me is an important word, is that it brings, articulation is bringing from something that's hidden into light. It is to name something that may not be named, and it connects. Articulated, you look at articulated lorries in the, in the UK or articulated trucks where you've got things that are connected together. Based on individual and context specific understandings, it goes to specifics in the midst of the everyday. So it's to look at what's going on in the middle of everyday practice and knowledge and then so you start at the base and it focuses on relational, historical, and contextual ways of understanding. So when you try to see what's going on, you say who is in relation, where's the historical nature, and what's the contextual ways of understanding. Now, a key component here is that context, you don't take people out of the context. You keep that context intact. You keep the relation, and the biggest, one of the bigger things here is the his, is the um, historical, and you see that it's ways of understanding which keeps it on the how. So this way of common understanding and having some common meaning, which is challenging when you're working amongst cultures and working with where is our common meaning and where is the difference meaning and how do you work with that. That's an area that um, I, I think merits more um, exploration in this area. So. A hermeneutic approach when we get to um, KT focuses on the how. How learning occurs, 
how evidence is taken up, how knowledge evolves, because it's not that knowledge is necessarily uh, applied, if knowledge is not contextual, uh, it's not a contextual, it is contextual, how actions are taken up or not taken up in particular places and situations, and it attends to timing and pacing of change. Explicitly attends to timing and pacing. Um, not to the time or the pace, but to the timing and pacing. So when you have that KT, you look at the how in context, in time, and um, in place. Hermeneutic approach does not create theory. It doesn't create common themes, often which are acontextual and atemporal. And it doesn't identify behaviors as outcomes. All of these are things that are expected in many. Like, what are the, um, the, the list? Give me a list of facilitators and barriers and to implementing something, and I will then start to work on those barriers or start to work on what facilitates it. It does not take those themes, which are contextual and atemporal, it might identify what's stopping things or what's barriers, but it's in context and it is particular. So it does keep to the context and the situation. It considers that situations, what you're working in right now in each of your areas is always temporal, comes from the past, is in the present and moves towards the future. Um, and that is something that's sometimes very hard to get your head around because we keep expecting to apply knowledge into practice. We apply a, for instance, a, a surgical checklist and we expect it to be able to be applied in practice over a three month period and then it stays. And there's an, it doesn't consider that situations are always temporal. Um, People change, times change, physical actions change. We expect that aspect of, of concreteness and atemporality. Hermeneutic approach articulates differences and discontinuities in context and in timing. You don't just look for commonalities. And that's something that we tend to do, um, we, we really tend to do a lot. We tend, and that, to me, the way in which we do that is we try to see what is in common, and we often try to uh, go for something that would be, in statistical language, central tendency. Because what you can then do, if you see what things in common, you can see central tendencies, then you can predict. You can take that and say, I predict that this will happen there. Now, we know in qualitative work, when we work qualitatively, we're not supposed to generalize. We're not supposed to um, come up with something that is um, uh, can be um, predictive. However, we, in order to move forward in in the world and in our jobs and in our work, we really try to do things in ways that will predict that there will be success tomorrow. The transferability aspect of it is something that we. We say, okay, we can't be generalizable, but we can be um, transferable. But what you have to do in order to make something generalizable or transferable is decontextualize it. You've got to separate it from time and place so we can spread it. And I think that's one of the biggest concerns about, and one of the biggest reasons why uh, there hasn't been that success in spread. So. What we talk about is, oh, we've got to contextualize, okay? So we being contextualizing things is, is a big area, and we can talk about that later. Um, but if you study or look at knowing in an acontextual way and presume that you can then context, take it out, decontextualize it, and then recontextualize it, there's something about that how things work in practice that I would argue is violated. And that may be why this spread um, and movement is not working. So in order to, to look at what's going on in a context, um, I think taking a hermeneutic approach gets you looking in a very different way. 
it you produce what do you get out of it you can illustrate meaning that goes beyond the particular and we that might have some merit in in the areas of spread you can explain action in relation to their context which provides guidance for future action it cannot predict future action and you can produce a nuanced interpretation that's useful conceptually and symbolically we keep looking for instrumental use carol estabrooks talked about um, there's conceptual use of of evidence there's symbolic use of evidence and there's instrumental use of evidence. Instrumental use is that you can um, you get a checklist and then you um, can use it and you tick it off. Um, you produce a checklist, you create it, and then you implement it. And that creation of the checklist is an instrumental use of knowledge. The conceptual use of knowledge is where you think about things differently. Um, you produce knowledge and it helps you to turn your thinking around so you look at something um, quite differently. And symbolic use is where it can be used politically. You can, uh, um, and you can see um, how some policymakers can identify some knowledge as, as, as for the symbolism as it goes. I think in the knowledge translation world, we are really trying to focus on the instrumental use of knowledge, the creation of knowledge that can be used instrumentally and trying to figure out more and better ways to put that instrumental knowledge into practice in an instrumental way. Hermeneutics doesn't do that. It will give you something that is useful conceptually and symbolically, which is why I think that there's room for other ways of knowledge creation and translation, because we do need checklists. Um, we do need checklists, uh, but not for everything. So what's needed to understand a hermeneutic approach? Um, this, is a, this is a road on Haida Gwaii, um, on the west, far west coast of this country. And it's a, a, to, in order to understand a hermeneutic approach, uh, there, is a, there is a path, uh, but it needs to be traveled. And it, it's not something that's easy to pick up, but it comes in a, as a way of traveling and a way of being. So in order to understand the hermeneutic approach, it's to dwell, you'll see me with phrases here that may or may not fit, uh, but it speaks to a way of approaching the world. And it, it really is easily taken up by some people, but it's not by others. And I think it's not, a, because it's not a technique and it's not an instrumental way of being, it's not an instrument. So. To undertake a hermeneutic approach to KT, you need to dwell in practice with the confidence that knowing and knowledge is embedded in practice. So you've got to look already at what is there. There has to be a perspective that there is knowledge in practice, that practitioners come into practice with knowledge, um, that patients come into the work that they do with knowledge, with managers have knowledge embedded in practice. Now, they might not be able to articulate it, in fact, they, they rarely, rarely can. Um, for instance, one of the things I've, I've shadowed expert nurses in, and I could see um, in a clinic following two different uh, nurses who had uh, two, uh, it was a chest tube clinic um, with, in, in a city where there was a lot of uh, lung issues and the people came in for their, for their indwelling chest tubes to be changed. And I could see how one person had finely tuned her, her feel and her hand. You could see the patient's um, the pain or lack of pain on, the, um, on their faces as this particular nurse manipulated and, and, and um, worked with this. And you could hear them talk about that differently with the nurse. What they talked about was different. Uh, what they revealed to her was different and how she spoke with them was different. Um, the the um, other nurse was, uh, you could see more pain, you could see um, her, her lack of confidence in her fingertips, as well as um, what she talked about and what she uh, then attended to. So, but with both of them, 
when we talked about it, you could hear where the knowledge was in practice and that they both had knowledge. Neither of them thought they knew anything, the, these two nurses, neither of them thought they knew anything about this. But when you, uh, when they talked about stories of working with patients, you could hear the knowledge that they had coming out embedded in practice. And I thought to myself, if we could, um, one of them had some misconceptions of knowledge, others had um, ideas about how she might then want to extend it, but kept her knowledge in question. Okay, knowledge practitioner practitioners and practitioners are uncovering, confirming, extending, refining, expanding, and augmenting ways of knowing and action. So when you recognize and think that there's knowledge embedded in practice, then it's not a matter of applying knowledge to practice. It's a matter of uncovering knowledge that is there, confirming, extending, and refining. And refining can be turning around. Refining can be um, realizing that, uh, can be working with people and having them realize that what they've been doing is not the most recent evidence that may be harmful, that may not be achieving the goals that they expect to, and then expanding or augmenting ways of knowing and acting. But there's a belief that there is knowledge there already. Dialogue. Dialogue begins and ends with listening. A good interpreter is a good listener. And I, I know all of us have been um, with our own physicians or primary care providers, and we know who's a good listener and who's not a good listener. Um, I'll never forget uh, my, taking my mother in with a, um, she was having, um, she was 88 um, and having difficulty breathing. And we took her into my GP, she was visiting us, and she starts to talk, barely. He's listening and he moves from his history, the taking, to just imperceptibly through to a prescription. And I'm realizing that he's listening to her in many, many different ways and is then um, making a prescription. We ended up having to go over to the hospital for, um, for some fluid. She was, uh, she was um, dehydrated. And what I realized is that as he was listening, he was listening not only to what she was saying, he was listening to her with his eyes, with his ears, um, and then to um, understanding, putting that all together into a whole and then moving on. Now, did he obviously do the lists of things that should be done? No, he didn't. But that knowledge was integrated into his, uh, into his actions and into his ways of, of, of being. Entering into dialogue with the situation of the text, one of the things that, that you need to look at is how is this uh, text uh, following and how is it? What questions is the text asking of me? And when good questions are asked, new knowledge can be produced. It's a process of to and fro. Entering the situation with prejudgments, keeping prejudgments in question, and seeking a fusion of horizons. When you talk about seeking, of, and this picture is from a French artist about um, a fusion of horizons. If people come with one way of looking, Others come with other prejudgments, and then you come into dialogue with that. The hermeneutic circle. The process is not linear. It's characterized by the hermeneutic circle. It's a process of moving towards understanding. So that's why questions are such a big question, a, a big part of a hermeneutic approach, looking at the whole and the, and the parts, and understanding ex, expands. So, the goal is not to understand the text or situation, but to understand something in front of it. Um, the human, as Clifford Geertz talk about, the human project. What is projected in front of you? You see that uh, Patricia Benner is there, and, and we've got um, Nancy Newell's work and some of mine. So universals or theories, as I've talked about, are not identified, but human context and world are explicated, articulated, and extended. So are we coming or going? And with this, you're both going and coming at the same time. We have a project that's ongoing that is supported by the BC Support Unit. 
Um, you can see that I'm the project lead and we have people from University of Calgary, UBC, um, Ottawa, and patient partner. And we want to advance implementation science. Our rationale is that the complexity is seldom directly addressed. Um, much of what happens is identifying problems once in a time. We need to know more about how practitioners work. And particularly in rural and northern settings, we need new ways of understanding implementation practices. Our study objectives are to articulate what it means to take a philosophical hermeneutic approach and then to do two major things, to summarize and then advance understanding. So the methods are two. The first one is a knowledge synthesis or the scoping review and the second part is um, interviews and um, observations and we're taking two things. We're taking both where the researchers are working with uh, the evidence that's being directed, uh, created, and then the other aspect we're looking at is how practitioners who are creating innovations are actually bringing in research and other evidence. And we're not sure yet about the knowledge translation, but we think digital storytelling might be a way to do it. And we're very thankful for the SPORE support with that. Now here's some references for the whole presentation. And I just realized we've got, uh, I, I've talked a little longer than anticipated, um, but perhaps we can head to some questions and discussion. Katie. Hi, thanks very much, uh, Dr. McLeod. That was a, an excellent and really engaging presentation. Um, I particularly enjoyed some of your analogies and the visual images. Um, I have never connected golf with knowledge translation before, but it really resonated with me. So thank you for that. Um, I can get started with a couple of questions and then Megan uh, check in with you um, and the rest of our audience about um, any others that might have come in. Um, and Dr. McLeod, as you might anticipate, um, my question is now that you've given us some of these, this really important foundation into hermeneutics and its uh, potential application in KP, can you help us with some examples and can you share some sort of stories about how you have used this or how we could apply this on the ground? Okay, I, I'd just like to give one, um, one example of that because we're still exploring what it really means. This hermeneutics is used um, in, in research, but in terms of actual knowledge translation, we're not really sure, um, we, we, we think it is, we think it's there in practice, but to say, okay, definitively, this is its use in knowledge translation, we don't know. In Northern Health, uh, they are moving, uh, implementing the uh, integration of primary health care, uh, primary care and home and community care, mental health and addictions and public health in creating primary care homes and an integrated uh, professional team around them. One of the things that's happened, they've been doing this for quite a number of years, and um, the implementation has got stuck. Uh, and they've been looking at how to move it forward. Well, they're using a process that is a hermeneutic process of a series of set questions um, moved now by their frontline managers and middle managers in that area to work with the, the primary care providers, the physicians, the nurse practitioners, and the interprofessional teams working through questions about um, the implementation itself. And they're identifying the, the goal is not to create answers, but rather to um, open up a dialogue so that through that dialogue they can come up with uh, uh, common understandings or uh, and understandings and differences about the particular situations around patients and their patient population um, and then what can they do together to move the, um, the implementation of the evidence forward. So that process itself is a hermeneutic process and uh, we hope to be studying uh, part of that to try and tease out what are the components or features of that that make it work. Great, thank you. I think that's really interesting how the, you know, really driving home how the perspective is not to create answers, but to create that dialogue. 
um, and work together. That really seems like the key piece in all of it. Uh, maybe I'll um, check in here, Megan, and see if we have any questions from our audience. Uh, yes, thank you. So we have one um, from Western University. Um, they are asking, uh, they said, it looks like a collective case study approach could be used via a hermeneutic process. As long as it's well bounded, um, would you agree? And the second part, um, perhaps you could comment on a collective case study within this approach. Okay. Um, now, I'm not sure what a collective case study is. Um, and But certainly taking a case uh, it's something that we do. For instance, this example I just gave you, we've got three communities and we're going to be looking at um, uh, at how um, the, the implementation of knowledge is happening in these three, um, in these three areas. Um, so the case study, in terms of the collective case study, I'm not really familiar, uh, I'm not so really familiar with what it is. What it is, uh, what I'm talking about is hermeneutics is a, is a stance and a way through it. You do need um, some research uh, techniques in order to do it. So that case, that a bounded case study is, is a fine way to work it. It's just how you approach it and what you do with it and what you're intending to accomplish out of it. Okay, great. Um, I don't have any other questions from the audience at the moment. Okay, perhaps I'll finish with uh, one last question before we let uh, Dr. McLeod and our audience go. Um, the other thing that I was sort of thinking about when you were talking about um, the, the balance and the, the importance of context and contextualization that, you know, is really embedded in the concept of hermeneutics, and how do you balance the need for that contextualization when you have a really sort of solid, uh, well-established, quote-unquote, piece of evidence that that there is a strong rationale for, for implementing or adopting. How do you, how do you handle that in, with a hermeneutic approach? Right. I think that we've got to, that, that notion of fidelity is a really, I, I think, under examine notion um, because, for instance, uh, the Ottawa ankle rules, those are very simple rules that one, hopefully, then it's, it's, it's well balanced in evidence, it's very concrete, it's very finite. And um, having those implemented and, and picked up in practice, I think is, is, is very, um, is, is very important. Um, and keeping the fidelity to those, if they can be, uh, because they're simple and if they can then be picked up and used and incorporated into everyday way of being in practice, makes a great deal of sense. Others, you cannot. And an example of that is um, in Northern BC, the attachment theories that had been created about how um, mothers and, and newborns attach, and if you have um, attachment, then you've got better um, outcomes as with your young children who might have difficulties, and this is with, with women who uh, might be addicted to opioids, et cetera. What they identified in Northern BC is that the research had all been done in clinics in large urban areas with uh, trained psychologists. There was one child psychologist at the time in the entire northern BC, and of course they couldn't implement that, although it was an important thing to do. So what they looked at were what were the kinds of components of that intervention and tried to work with um, women and others in First Nations communities, working out how those major components of that attachment theory could be implemented um, given the local knowledge, the indigenous knowledges um, in those communities. So it was a working through and a working out rather than just a straight application. Thanks very much. 
Um, so I think we are coming uh, to the end of our session for today. Um, on behalf of our audience, Dr. McLeod, I'd like to thank you so much for your presentation, and I'd like to thank all of you um, throughout Canada, wherever you are, for attending and joining us today. Uh, please do complete your evaluations of the session. Um, you can either email them to Megan or you can complete the online evaluation. Uh, and last but not least, the final reminder that our next session will be with Dr. Matthew Veneer from the University of Laval. That will be in approximately one month's time in early November. Uh, Megan, would that be November 8th, the next time you get together? Uh, yes, sorry about that. It's the second Thursday in November, which I believe is November 8th. Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, have a great day and we'll see you next month. Okay, and thank you from me to Dr. McLeod, Dr. Sibley, and, uh, and everyone who joined. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.